Hello, my name is Alexandra Vakru. I'm the executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies at Harvard University. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Catherine Wasserman Davis Memorial Lecture, which is co-sponsored by the Davis Center, Wellesley College, and Wheaton College every year. This year, we're very fortunate to have a very uh, timely topic, the Navalny phenomenon, a self-made hero, and we're pleased to have Evgenia Markovna Albats, a Russian investigative journalist, political scientist, author, and radio host as our guest. Since 2007, Evgenia Albats has run the New Times, a Moscow-based Russian language independent political weekly as the political editor, the CEO, and the editor-in-chief. Since 2004, she's also hosted Absolute Albats, a talk show on Echo Moskvi, the only remaining liberal radio station in Moscow, in Russia. Albats has also been an Alfred Friendly Press Fellow, assigned to the Chicago Tribune in 1990, and a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University in 1993. She's a member of the International Consortium of Inter Investigative Journalists since its founding in 1996. Albats is also the author of four independently researched books, including one on the history of the Russian political police called The State Within a State, the KGB and its hold on Russia, past, present, and future. She's taught at Yale and the University of Michigan and served as a full-time professor at Moscow's Higher School of Economics, teaching institutional theory of the state and bureaucracy until 2001, when her courses were canceled at the request of top Kremlin officials. Zhenya has a PhD in political science from Harvard University and recently served as a senior fellow in residence at the Davis Center before returning to Moscow this spring. We're very happy to welcome her back today in the virtual world to deliver the annual Davis Memorial Lecture. Zhenya, over to you. Sasha, thank you so much. And thank you very much to the Davis Center and to all the people there. I really miss you. <laughs> and it's so nice to see all of you. And I'm grateful to the Center University for uh, having me with this lecture. So um, hopefully we're going to have a uh, 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 normal uh, internet. Sometimes it's not very good here uh, in downtown Moscow. Anyway, uh, as, uh, as Alexandra said, I'm going to talk about the Navalny's phenomena. Uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, a 44 year old, in fact, tomorrow he turns 45, um, has been a well, well known uh, blogger and investigative journalist and a presenter and a politician until, uh, and until he became and uh, lately he became the leader of the Russian uh, opposition. However, the world got to know him, really got to know him on August 20th, 2020. Um, uh, it was two months after Russians voted for the major amendments to their constitution, which destroyed the latter and gave Putin an almost eternity in power. Alexei Navalny, the then 44-year-old Russian politician and author of the major investigations on corruption among Russian elite was on the four hour long flight from the Siberian city, Tomsk, back home, which is Moscow. Two hours into the flight, Navalny felt sick, went to a bathroom, then got out and told the flight attendant, I was poisoned, I'm dying. Shortly after, he collapsed on the floor. I had no pain, Navalny explained later, I just knew that was it. That was the end of my life. Shortly after he lost his consciousness, Thanks to the captain of this private airline S7 and stupidity on the part of the assassins, the flight was interrupted half the way and it landed at the port of the city, at the city of Omsk. As you can see on this first slide on the left, Alexei Navalny shortly before he boarded the flight in the airport, and, and the, on the photo on the right, 
uh, it's already Omsk airport. Navalny sorry, on stretch. Genia, and I'm so sorry to interrupt. Already... I, yes? I don't see your slides. You don't? No. Just. We did see slides of what happened. Why we no longer see slides? Did you share the screen? Yes, of course, we did all that and we checked all that uh, before we started, but then probably, you know. Okay, now, it, now it's good. Can you see it now? Yes, yep, perfect. Uh-huh. Thank you, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, so the, the flight was interrupted halfway and the plane landed uh, at the airport of the city Omsk. It's two hour, uh, it's halfway from Tomsk to Moscow. Someone unknown called the Omsk airport security and warned that a bomb was planted at the airport. This was Navalny's second good luck. The emergency car arrived directly to the and the paramedic Paramedicked his peoples and said, addict, overdose. The paramedic stated that and injected Navalny with atropine, one of the antidotes that was required in case of poisoning with a military nerve agent from the Novichok group. The next 18 days, Navalny spent in coma. He did know that he spent 48 hours in the Omsk hospital full of checkers who stood behind almost each and every doctor. He did not know that the head doctor in his statement to the, to the media completely ruled out poisoning and told journalists that the patient had a metabolic disorder. By the way, shortly after uh, that uh, head doctor was promoted to the position of the chief regional doctor. Now, while he did not know that a private medical plane was waiting for him on the airfield for two days, ready to take him to Berlin, to, Berlin, uh, to the well-known uh, charity clinic, which already was involved in several cases of Novichok poisoning. But Russian doctors kept saying that the patient wasn't transportable. Thanks God, he didn't see the face of his wife, uh, Yulia Navalny, when she was leaving the intensive care unit where her husband was dying. Alexei was shaking with convulsions. He was arching on the bed and it was scary to see it. It was up to the Russian President Putin to open the skies for Navalny, to let him out of the hospital, turn to prison. Putin wanted Yulia Navalny to beg him, take her husband for medical treatment abroad, and she was advised to do as much by some go-betweens. Yet, Yulia, uh, Yulia wrote a letter to President Putin. You can see this, the picture. Sorry, it's written in Russian because that's what we do in Russia. We write in Russian. So that's the letter that she wrote, that's the, the copy of the original that she wrote to President Putin in which she demanded, yes, you heard me right. She didn't beg, but she demanded that her husband be released for treatment abroad. Quote, I hereby formally demand permission to transport Alexei Anatolievich Navalny to the Federal Republic of Germany, she wrote. Date, signature, no, no, nothing like your excellently Mr. President at the beginning of the letter, nothing at the end, something like respectfully yours or with gratitude at the end of it, just date and signature. She knew Alexei wouldn't forgive her any request from, for, from Putin. He never wanted, couldn't, and was unable to stand being obliged to anyone. 
the rule of three N of the Soviet Gulag political prisoners. Do not believe, do not be afraid, do not ask. This rule became Navalny's rule in his relationship with the Czechist bureaucracy. After 18 days in coma and 24 days in intensive care, Navalny awoke, awoke with his memory wiped clean and his life skills destroyed. He didn't recognize the love of his life, his wife, Yulia. Quote, I felt the warmth emanating from the hands that straightened my pillow. It was very pleasant for me, but I didn't know whose hands they were. He wrote later in his Instagram uh, post. Cognitive and intellectual abilities returned to him quickly, but with the return of, uh, but it was more difficult with the return of the functions of his hands and feet. The doctor told him that he needed to climb the mountains and he went to the Bavarian mountains to get his must of arms and feet back, back so he could get into the car without dragging his leg in with his hands. He ran, he jumped, he climbed day after day, week after day. He hated it as much as he hated jogging when he decided to get himself fit several years ago. Navalny was rebuild rebuilding himself in order to get strong by the time he meets those who ordered him to be killed face to face. In his first interview after coming out of, of a coma and 40 days after he was poisoned, Navalny told German Weekly Spiegel that he plans to return back to Moscow as quickly as possible. Quote, refusing to return would mean that Putin has achieved his goal. Now my task is to remain the guy who is not afraid. And I'm not afraid. Let my hands shake. It's not because of fear, but because of this thing, he meant poisoning. I'm not going to give Putin such a gift and not return to Russia, end of quote. He said on January, uh, he said, on January 17th, 2021, Navalny and his wife uh, boarded the Berlin Moscow flight of Russian discount with the telling name Pabeda, Victory. Navalny got arrested while he was crossing the state border at the Moscow airport Sheremetyevo. 33 days later, Kangaroo Court sentenced him to 36 months in the penal colony on a totally trump up uh, charges. He wrote to me, you can see the copy of this prison late letter. He wrote to me responding to my letter from the FSB jail. Genia, everything is okay. History is happening. Russia is going through it and we're coming along. We will make it, probably. I'm all right and I have no regrets and you shouldn't either and shouldn't worry. Everything will be all right. And even if it isn't, we'll have the consolation of having lived honest lives. Hans. The translation of this letter was made by Mash. Yes. In 2004, soon after completing my PhD at Harvard, I returned back to Moscow and they began teaching institutional theory of the state and bureaucracy at the university at the Moscow based to the high school of economics. It was politically at that time in Moscow, the democratic parties lost the elections to the state Duma, the Russian parliament. The country was enjoying the windfall profits from the skyrocketing oil revenues. Putin was battered in love. The richest man in the country, Mikhail Khodorkovsky was already in prison. His oil company, Yukos, had already been nationalized, and the Russian elite had already been bought out by 13% flat scale taxes. As a theory holds it, benefits in exchange for freedom. That's the policy that was taking momentum in Russia. 
I decided to gather young politicians of a democratic orientation at my home to study with them grassroots politics, along with a little bit of Aristotle and a little bit of Locke. Now, when I learned about our Tuesday meetings from one of the regulars, Ilya Yashin, Yashin was already very well known. He established himself as a bright and courageous young politician involved in all kinds of st uh, street protests, and he was regularly detained by the police. Back then, Navalny was the deputy head of the Moscow branch of the Social Democratic Party, Yablaka, with its leader, uh, Grigory Yavlinsky. And he also headed some committee for the protection of Moscovites, hosted an obscure program at Echo Moscow at the time when no one listened, and fought the construction lobby in the capital. I saw a young, handsome, blue-eyed young man, very attentive, smart, but slightly hostile, prone to overweight, and already with, the, with, this, beer, uh, with this beer belly, which is the case with those who avoid fitness. He was older than the other 20 some uh, people in the group. He was 28 years old back then. He was married and had a daughter, Dasha. He was very reliable and organized. And uh, in our group, Navalny took on the functions of relations with the Moscow mayor's office, where it was necessary to deliver the notification for the uh, rally. The 51st article of the Russian constitution, the right for assembly, was still in effect back then. Navalny led one of those rallies from the stage, together with the bright and beautiful Natalia Maral, who would later become the special correspondent for My Daily Times, and after publishing an, a hit investigation, was deported to her home country, Moldova, at the order of that of the FSB. At that rally, Navalny turned, turned out to be no speaker. I looked at him and I thought, such a handsome guy, smart and goal-oriented, but he has a long way to go to become a public politician capable to energize and conquer the crowd. He learned everything. Two years later, Alexei Navalny invited me to his 30th birthday party. There I met his parents who lived outside Moscow in the closed military compound. His father was a military lawyer, his mother was an accountant. By that time, Ludmila Ivanovna already had her own business, a small basket weaving factory. The factory made, made handmade souvenirs and some simple furniture for duchess, which Alexei and his younger brother, Oleg, were selling near the bus stop right on the highway, uh, 30 kilometers east of Moscow. Fast forward, the business was totally destroyed in the late summer of 2012, when Putin first took on Navalny. But back to the Navalny story's birthday celebration. There I first saw Yulia Navalny, a young, slender, stylish, and a very beautiful woman. She was affable and at the same time reserved. She held everyone at her outstretched hand. The Snow Queen, I thought watching Alexei literally winding around her. This guy has an incentive to become a great politician, I thought. He wants to prove to this amazing woman that he's worthy of her. That first observation turned out to be right. And now when numerous, numerous interviewers ask me to tell them how Navalny became Navalny, I always say, please, Keep in mind that politician Navalny is not one, but two people, Yulia and Alexei Navalny. So what Navalny did to evolve from a blogger to a leader of the Russian opposition willing and capable to challenge uh, Putin. First, he went on hard, he went on hard learning and reading and studying. Navalny grew up in the family of the military man, uh, and uh, they lived, as I said, in the military compound, so schools were no good in those compounds. Besides, they had to move from uh, one place to another. Of course, Navalny was lucky to have a mom who was and is a fervent reader. 
She made and she made her both boys to read good literature. She has been interested in democratic politics during the perestroika, and Alexei got, uh, Alexei got hooked on politics uh, either. Navalny failed to get into the prestigious Moscow State University Faculty of Law, but was accepted to the similar faculty at Patricia Lumumba University of People's French. It is the alma mater for many students from the countries in Africa and Asia, which the USSR was coaching back in 1970s and 1980s. The school was low on education, but high on drugs. While on a fellowship at Yale in 2010, Navalny was busy learning the system of uh, the US system of politics, parties machine, role of the House Appropriation Committees, conflict of interest, of interest uh, practices that are uh, uh, also he was very inter interested in the class action suits non-existent in Russia. Beginning 2012, he used to spend quite some time in jails from a few weeks in 2012 to 140 days in 2017, 2018. He already, he, by, by that time, he already created his anti-corruption foundation and was organizer of the major uh, protests in Moscow. The minute Navalny showed up at the rally, he got arrested. That's how he ended spending weeks and weeks and weeks in the Moscow detention jails. It was the time for him to read books. Uh, in 2014, Navalny spent eight months under house arrest uh, in a two room Soviet style apartment with no balcony, bulk, uh, balcony and with a 24 seven surveillance conducted from the apartment that the FSB bought in the apartment in the tower nearby. It was literally, uh, FSB bought the apartment what, what, that was on the same level as Navalny's apartment and Navalny's kitchen window was looking into this apartment. So the life of this family of two adults and two kids were under constant surveillance day and night. When I came to see him there during his house arrest, I found him speaking English fluently. And I saw volumes and volumes of political science books on institutions, governance, bureaucracy, democratization, economics, and everything else standing on his bookshelves. Books were, of course, in English. There is very little that available uh, of that sort in uh, Russian. I realized that he got a very good advisors and one of them was Sergei Guriev, the then Dean of the New School of Economics that who uh, later on had to uh, go in exile to France after um, FSB went after him. By the way, so you can visualize it Navalny off, Navalny's office during his eight months of house arrest was located at, uh, at the entrance of his two-room apartment. So, and uh, in this same place was his gym, his living and dining rooms. And the size of this hallway was approximately four square meters, something like, you know, nine, 90 square feet large. While under house arrest, he apparently learned to be a speaker. At the major rally in January 2012, he made a speech which got him millions of supporters across the country. And even Grigory Olinsky, I saw it with my own eyes, recognized him as an equal. It is worth mentioning here that Grigory Lilinsky, the lifelong leader of the Yablaka party, the social democratic or sort, sort of a social democratic party, um, he, uh, at, at some point when he saw Navalny and Ilya Yashin as emerging competitors, he just kicked them out of the Yablaka party on the basis 
Navalny was kicked out because he was proclaimed a nationalist and Yashin was kicked out for some other uh, similar sort of reasons. In 2013, Navalny ran for mayor of Moscow and ran a, a Western style grassroots campaign uh, Russians never experienced before. Much of the tools that he used during the campaign he learned while watching the US and the UK made TV series, The Wire First and For Most. For instance, for the first time in the Russian politics, while Navalny was making speeches and meeting with people in the court, in the uh, apartment yards and on the streets and at the corners and in the parks, um, his uh, assistants Put, um, put chairs. Uh, no one ever did this before because, you know, usually people who came to the uh, rallies back then, uh, they were uh, people in the late 60s and 70s. So he placed these chairs and he told me later that he saw that exactly this was done in this TV series, The Wire, as if you remember the, this series, the, uh, there were um, uh, elections going on in Baltimore for the city office. Uh, I remember myself, I was on the flight from London back to Moscow. And uh, at that time, two books just came out, uh, which I bought at the kiosk located right at the gate in, uh, uh, in the, this London airport. One book was the, uh, the last Le Carre spy novel. Another one, Hillary Clinton's What Happened. What Happened is the book that Hillary Clinton wrote about the, her unfortunate 2016 presidential run. I wrote to Navalny who was in the court awaiting another, yet another administrative sentence, meaning that he was going to spend next two to four weeks in jail. I wrote to him, I have these two books. What do you want? What do you want me to pass you to jail? He wrote back, Clinton, of course. And of course, you know, I passed this uh, Hillary Clinton's book to him in jail. In, you know, in the administrative jails, uh, the rules are much more flexible than in, uh, in the real ones. For instance, now that you know, Navalny in the panel colony, it's close to impossible uh, to pass any book. You have to send it only through the special online bookstore. The second major achievement that made Navalny the leader um, was that he managed to turn his anti-corruption foundation, which he established, uh, founded in, 2000, in uh, 2010, he turned it into a major YouTube-based media conglomerate, media company, which raised millions uh, in uh, donations on the web, had a well-equipped studio and conducted the most high acclaimed investigations on corruption of the top Russian bureaucrats. His 2017 documentary on the one-time accidental Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, got an audience of more than 40 million views. His investigation, he, he, he uh, as you may know, he also investigated uh, his own um, assassination along with the billion cats, Krista Grozyev. His, uh, these also uh, had the audience of uh, several uh, million people. His latest uh, investigation on mega billion Putin's palace on the Black Sea that he released after he already came, returned back to Moscow and was arrested on uh, January 17, 2020. So after, you know, these, uh, these documentary uh, had an, has had an audience of 117 million views. YouTube uh, at large 
due to Navalny and you know some other very uh, very talented and journalist has become the major source of information for young Russians for those Russians at the of the uh, at the age group 1935 and that of course is Navalny constituency finally Navalny made sure to position himself as a politician capable to speak and to connect to Russians from all walks of life. During the 2018 presidential campaign, he was the only candidate who ran his campaign all across 11 Russian time zones. The outpost of his anti-corruption movement, to be sure that Navalny never was allowed to register his own party. Um, so these outposts, Shtabi headquarters, were established in 81 cities of the Russian Federation all across Russia, from Moscow to Vladivostok, from Vladivostok to Kaliningrad, from Kaliningrad to Murmansk. He spoke in each and every one of it. Uh, Navalny was banned from the elections. Uh, by the way, you know, um, I put here, you know, just, you know, that's of course, you know, at the bottom, his uh, uh, his um, this is the uh, uh, poster that was made for 2018 elections, and here's you know Navalny on May 6, 2012, when uh, Vladimir Putin was inaugurated. That day, now Vladimir Putin was inaugurated uh, for his third term term in office. There was a big rally, and of course, Navalny was arrested. On the right, you may see Navalny on, in, it, it's the picture made on May two, uh, 2017. Navalny walked out of the, his office and uh, some uh, bad guys, very well known, you know, we know their names, yet they never were investigated or jailed or anything like that, put a green uh, stuff in his face. As a result of that, Navalny lost, almost lost vision in his uh, left eye. He, under, uh, in, uh, he had a, a surgery uh, and uh, he returned a little bit. He managed to get a little bit of vision in his eye um, after that. Navalny was in 2000, 2018, Despite of his campaign, despite of the signatures of millions of Russians who were ready to vote for him, he was banned uh, from the elections. On the uh, his name never got on the ballot. But since 2018, he established himself as a real alternative to Putin, as the one willing and capable to challenge the uh, to change to challenge. Uh, Putin. That is why they tried to murder him. Yet he didn't die. That is why he's in a panel colony now, ridden Nietzsche's on the advantage and disadvantage of history for life, and perpetual peace and other essays by Emmanuel Kant in his panel colony. He also ordered Locke, Quran, and Torah to be delivered to his Lambert camp as well. The books were to be checked on issues of extremism and I'm really concerned that neither Quran nor Torah will make it through. You know, of course it's a joke, but anyway. Meanwhile, Kremlin initi initiated three more criminal cases against Navalny, but he will overcome. So do we. Thank you. I also uh, also wanted to tell you uh, that tomorrow, it just so happened on June 4th, uh, Navalny turns 45 and he's going to celebrate this in the in a, in a tuberculosis hospital, uh, which located in the maximum security labor camp number, number three in the city, Vladimir. Thank you. I will be happy to answer your question. Oh. Thank you, Genia. Why don't you turn off the screen sharing so we can see you in, in all your glory or more of your glory?
Um, and, and let me just ask just a quick follow-up question. He's in a, a tuberculosis hospital because of his, uh, his back issues, or does he now have tuberculosis as well? No, thanks God, you know, I hope that he's okay. Now, you know, Navalny went on the hunger strike. In fact, the last picture that I, I, I didn't show you, um, he went on the hunger strike uh, um, protesting the treatment that he got in the penal colony, uh, number two. Uh, he was refused all kind of uh, medical. Mm, uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he has uh, pain in his back, and of course, you know, he still has trouble. He still has troubles with his arms and feet. So he requested uh, some medical support, and he was refused that. Um, he was given an ibuprofen, over-the-counter ibuprofen. Um, so he went on a hunger strike. Uh, he was 23 days on a hunger strike. He lost more than 20 kilos. Mm, uh, after that, and he all he requested was to be seen by a civilian doctor. While he was on the hunger strike, some 120 celebrities, first names in uh, literature, in uh, movie production, uh, in journalism, and et cetera, um, signed a letter to President Putin uh, uh, requesting medical treatment for Navalny. So shortly after that, he was uh, uh, allowed, he was uh, taken uh, to the civilian hospital. He, he underwent uh, treatment and uh, certain checkups, MRI was made and etc. So he stopped uh, his hunger strike. However, because he was uh, uh, three weeks on a hunger strike, there's a special protocol how you get out of it. So that's why he was taken to the hospital. But the only hospital existed in the vicinity of his uh, penal colony, was located inside this maximum security prison, and it is a, a tuberculosis hospital. I see. So one of the things that's, that's clear from your talk is that Navalny has been extremely effective in getting attention, uh, attention from Putin and also attention from supporters. And one of the questions we have is whether the approach that the Kremlin has taken to dealing with, let's call it the Navalny problem, is really the most effective one. They put him in jail, he gets more attention, and might it have been better if they just ignored him and allowed him to continue doing what he was doing? I guess it's, you mean, uh, first of all, they cannot do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, regime in Russia is... Um, is evolving, uh, we see that uh, as a result of uh, uh, Navalny investigations, Putin's ratings is going down the hill. Uh, there is a lot, of, a lot of concern about the upcoming um, uh, parliamentary elections, which are going to happen in uh, late September of 2021. Uh, therefore, um, Kremlin is trying to shut down whatever they can. Navalny, there is, a, there is no way you can shut down Navalny. You can kill him. That's what they try to do. Um, however, if he's uh, out, uh, um, uh, out and free to go, then of course he will organize a, a protest and you know some demonstration rally. And besides. Uh, the, his uh, anti-corruption foundation was pronounced as uh, uh, as um, foreign entity. Uh, his uh, it was also put on the list of uh, extremist organizations. Therefore, um, no one now can transfer money. To, to the foundation, because whoever is doing this, for instance, I've been um, transferring money to this foundation for years, if not decades. Uh, I stopped doing this because uh, 
I can be, uh, I can get a criminal case against me uh, on the basis of support to terrorist organization as they consider anti-corruption foundation now as for authorities consider. Uh, so um, the, the majority of his colleagues from the anti-corruption foundation are in exile in Georgia, in Armenia, in, in the Baltics. And they're trying to run uh, the investigation from there. So this, uh, this raises another question about his popularity. I know that at the last uh, rallies that were launched after he was arrested, there were a large number of people who came out on the street and some of them were saying it's not so much that they supported Navalny, but they were just tired of the Putin regime uh, and the lack of political turnover. Is it, is it possible to say, given the problems with public opinion surveys that we have in Russia, is it possible to say how popular he actually is and with which demographics? And is he a real political threat in the sense of being a popular alternative to the current government? First of all, I think it's not true that people came out on the streets uh, only because they sick and tired of the regime. I was on this, uh, I was part of this rally. I was there on the street and I spoke to a lot of people around me. The majority of those, these were uh, students and postdocs and people from all kinds of creative professions. And they were young people. They were uh, twice younger than I am. And the, you know, and the absolute majority of those whom I spoke to, they kept saying that Navalny should be released. They are very angry that the guy who uh, chose to challenge Putin, uh, he, that he was uh, assassinated. Um, you know, those uh, uh, police uh, is using brutal force. Uh, against protesters uh, in Moscow and other cities. When Navalny returned back um, to Moscow in January 2021, uh, people went, came out on the streets in 93 cities all across Russia. It was the first time that so many people came out. And they came out because they see Navalny as an alternative to Putin. Finally, he... Uh, the, the, the whole reason why Putin's assassins uh, tried to kill Navalny was precisely that they understand that Navalny is a real alternative to Putin. For the first time in 20 years, there is a guy who is capable to challenge uh, Putin's authority and power. So let me ask about the, the mechanism by which he can challenge Putin's authority, right? If he's not allowed to run in elections and uh, the rallies, uh, they are an, an outlet for opposition, but they don't necessarily result in political change. And as you know, we, we talked about some of the research that suggests that authoritarian regimes tend to fall when there are cracks from the inside rather than as a result of political mobilization on the street. In what way do you think that, that Navalny can achieve his objectives and is that what is going to change the political regime in Russia? Yes, you're absolutely right. According to you know to uh, to um, to different kind of research, all of them they come to the same conclusion that in the postcode uh, that uh, uh, out of more than four hundred uh, authoritarian regimes that uh, uh, are known uh, in comparative political uh, science. Uh, 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 the absolute majority of them, I think some 80% of those regimes uh, collapsed as a result of the uh, coup d'etat or what we usually call split of the elites. So of course, popular mobilization uh, um, is unable to really to challenge uh, the corporate state that exists in the current Russia. However, um, uh, these uh, protests are important uh, for the elites uh, because that's, uh, you know, um, support of that of the people has been Putin's main resource. If you think about that, 
you want uh, you you, uh, you tell yourself okay Igri Sechin has such a resource as Ross Neft oil company the biggest oil company in the world he is uh, the CEO of the state run corporation uh, Sergey Chemis of a CEO of Rostia Corporation, you know, some other KGB guys and there's, you know, there are no civilians at these top positions. Uh, they, you know, they run Gazprom, they run, you know, they run all kinds of very wealthy uh, companies or they can control the whole uh, sectors of the Russian economy. The only thing that Putin has that they don't is his popularity is this, you know, the laugh of Russians who, uh, 86% of whom uh, supported his uh, annexation of Crimea back in 2014. However, uh, Putin's rating went down the hill. You know, they were around 39%, uh, the latest I saw. Uh, so, and, uh, and that's precisely what makes um, his uh, standing uh, among the elite is, is, is very complicated because uh, at some point, the same elites who are getting tired of being afraid, and Russia is in this uh, uh, period when um, KGB guys or, you know, Czechists, you know, uh, former KGB guys, current FSB guys, uh, arresting right and wrong that, you know, every day we hear about yet another, somebody got arrested, somebody's company, was confiscated, somebody was uh, taken from the plane, etc., etc. So um, um, at some point, um, these elites may decide that Putin is no longer capable to protect them uh, from people on the streets. And that's why it's so important to have uh, ma ma mass mobilization. Now, how is it is going to happen? I have no idea. I'm not, you know, we can, judging by what we know about the collapse of authoritarian regimes, we do know that usually, you know, as a result of the coup d'etat, palace coup or whatever, you know, a dictator steps down. Sometimes he, he gets to be alive, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes, you know, like it happened in Zimbabwe, you know, he really enjoys, you know, a nice retirement for a while. Um, Sometimes not. Uh, and unfortunately, as we know from the history of such uh, coup d'etats, uh, some sort of a military coup, uh, junta is coming into power after that. However, the legitimacy of these intermediates or, you know, of those who um, come after, um, it's, all, it's almost non-existent. So, uh, they they will have to sooner or later they will have to go for elections. I don't know whether you know I'm going to live long enough to see uh, free and fair presidential elections, but I have no doubt that in the period of the next year we will see a very very turbulent politics in Russia. One of the issues that uh, has led to people being somewhat ambivalent about Navalny and by by people here now, I'm talking about Western audiences, is uh, the fact that he can't shake the perception that he has nationalist views. Could you talk a little bit about whether you see him as being a, a nationalist, whether his views have evolved, um, and how you would describe those political views now? I think, uh, thank you. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a hot topic. Um, Navalny, I think that uh, any politician who is uh, running on the ticket of creating the nation state is doomed to become a nationalist. Any politician in the country that doesn't have any structured politics, in the country where political parties non-existence, where uh, uh, political groups are unable to channel uh, people's grievance, this uh, nationalism is, uh, uh, is an unavoidable um, way of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, political program of that or another politician. Uh, Alexei Navalny um, 
uh, has been presumed to be a Russian nationalist uh, back in the early stages of his career. And I think that he was absolutely right to run uh, to at least, you know, to talk about this stuff. Don't forget that back in um, 2005, 2006, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, young people uh, in the provinces and the outskirts of Moscow uh, from a humble background whose uh, brothers, elder brothers and, and uh, fathers fought at the Chechen war. The, that the first Chechen war, uh, Russia lost. These people felt extremely humiliated. They also saw liberals as those who supported uh, Chechens rather than uh, Russians. And it's true too that Russian media were very much against the war. In fact, it was almost, you know, uh, it was very similar to what happened in the United States during the Vietnam War, when media and, you know, universities and liberal politicians were against the war and veterans who were returning back from Vietnam felt betrayed and abandoned. So uh, it was sort of the same situation in Russia after the Second Chechen War. Uh, I think that Navalny did a great job back then that he spoke to these people, that he tried to explain to them that uh, his enemies, that, that their enemies were not people with uh, black hair or people of different ethnicity or religion, that people in power, those who were sitting in Kremlin were the, the real enemies. And he succeeded. That's why he became such a popular uh, politician and he got such a big constituency that no any other politician in Russia besides Putin has, precisely because that he learned how to speak to Russians of different walks of life. For him, there are no good Russians or bad Russians, right Russians or wrong Russians. Russians with proper views or Russians with wrong views. There is nothing you can do with people, you know, with, uh, with Russians. You cannot send them to Mars or to, you know, to some other planet. You have to deal with them here in Russia. And the way to deal with them here in Russia is to talk to them and not to uh, write them out as, uh, as somebody uh, who is... Um, unable to understand our bright uh, ideas. So uh, Navalny did extremely good job in that respect. As a result, uh, the most fierce nationalists whom I knew personally, uh, they moved to the center. That was very important. You don't want them to, uh, to become uh, uh, Putin's constituents. You want them to move to the center and to realize that uh, the big nation uh, the, uh, uh, bears responsibility for all others. That in order for uh, people of different ethnicities and religion to live in peace, you have to respect rights uh, of uh, the minorities. And that's exactly the kind of message that Navalny was pushing through. So, uh, I read, you know, after, you know, Amnesty International, there was, you know, this amazing case, stripped him um, from his, uh, um, from this label of prison of conscience because, you know, uh, some uh, Russia Today uh, puppets uh, managed, uh, uh, managed to uh, uh, almost hack the Amnesty uh, uh, International leadership in that respect, there were a lot of uh, um, people who were writing, you know, I even read, you know, I remember, you know, Arkady Ostrovsky, the leading um, Russian expert in the UK, uh, The Economist, he wrote that um, Navalny regretted uh, his uh, um, uh, 
uh, his romance with nationalists. Uh, it's not true. And if you ask Navalny now, he would say, absolutely, there are no bad Russians and good Russians. You have a, 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 someone who uh, is thinking to be, uh, becoming a president of the Russian Federation, you have to learn how to speak to everyone and to people of different walks of lives and different uh, ideas in different stances. You cannot expect uh, liberals, you know, people of Western values to be the majority in Russia. No way. You have to be a realist and he's a realist. So and I don't I, know which, yeah. Sorry, does that, does that also extend say to migrants? Who might be in the Russian Federation working? I think that that that's where a lot of the uh, the suspicions about his nationalist tendencies emerge. He made there some bad mistakes, no question asked. He did a couple of uh, videos that were disrespectful to uh, to migrants uh, from um, Russian Caucasus and from. Uh, Georgia and other republics in the Caucasus. It's absolutely true. He apologized. It was mis it was a mistake. It uh, um, by the way, you know, it happened. He did this. It was 2005, 2006. People do evolve and do change. Still, I believe that uh, that you you get to be Navalny in order to be able to, uh, to talk to very, very different Russians. That's why no uh, uh, leaders of the Russian uh, Democratic parties, even Boris Nemtsov, they, were, they didn't have the kind of uh, outreach to the Rus Russian public that uh, Navalny got. Can the movement survive him? If he's if he's locked in jail for years and years, or if God forbid something happens to him, is the movement that he started sustainable without him as the charismatic leader? I don't know. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to say. But I hope that uh, uh, that when. Uh, American President Joe Biden is going to meet with uh, President Vladimir Putin in Geneva on June 16th uh, this year, that President uh, Biden is going to, um, to challenge uh, Putin on, on this issue, an issue of political prisoners uh, who are sitting in jails all across uh, Russia. I think that if Americans decided uh, not to um, not to um, put sanctions on um, on this pipeline Nord Stream two, it's a Putin's baby. Um, then probably uh, Americans uh, think about uh, trading this for something uh, significant. And I think that release of Alexei Navalny from jail is one of those things for which uh, uh, Biden may want to trade uh, his, uh, um, you know, uh, his decision not to uh, not to um, impose sanctions on Nord Stream two. What else should the uh, the Biden administration do, in your opinion? The, the, the Americans have been frustrated uh, and let's say um, they've not come out on top in many negotiations with Putin over the past decades. So what should the Biden administration do um, in, in that summit meeting and beyond? I know it's not exactly your role to advise the Biden administration, but just curious, what, what do you think would be uh, more right. less effective? <laughs> You know, I really think that it's important for um, those who advise Biden, President Biden, to realize that Russia is not a USSR light. No way. It's not the USSR. 
um, not in size, uh, not uh, in the economy, but the most important, people who run Russia now and those who ran the USSR back there, these are totally different people. And what is really important to understand the current Russian leadership, uh, this, you know, the Czechos corporation that took over the country, it is that these people love money. They're in bed with the US dollar. So it's very different, yes. Um, USSR's nomenclatura, its leadership, uh, uh, lived the kind of life that uh, no Soviet person had or even could imagine to have. However, you know, Brezhnev had, you know, the collection of foreign made cars mm -hmm. and some good rifles. That's basically it, you know. They didn't know the kind of life that exists, existed outside the Soviet Union. They even never dreamed to have a yacht or a huge yacht or to have a uh, property in Italy as uh, Putin's closer friends uh, do, or to have a house in one of the best districts in Paris as Putin's daughter um, has, or uh, to build villas on Riviera as uh, the majority of them uh, did in the past years, or to have two houses in the um, in the close proximity to Atlanta, Georgia, as Putin's Rotenberg um, has. So I think that that's what really important to understand, that this leadership, this current leadership of the Russian Federation, they're not about ideology, they're not about ideas. Uh, they are predominantly about money, wealth. That's what they're afraid to lose. That's why they try, they try to kill Navalny and that's why they keep him in jail. So I think that for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, the, it will be a huge mistake is the current, if the current American administration decides to, uh, if the current American administration will go for, for the kind of policy that was developed by uh, Henry Kissinger, the Secretary of State back in the, um, in, uh, in the Nixon administration. It is, you know, we need um, stable and predictable Russia and no one should care what's going inside Russia. It will be a very, very big mistake because the current regime that exists in Russia, it's a problem not just for us, it is for us, but it's a huge problem for you too and for Europeans uh, as much. There are two dictatorships now exists in Europe, Russia and Belarus, and Europeans already had a, uh, had a fortune to see how Belarusian dictator uh, Lukashenko forced to land a civilian airplane with 130 passengers on board in order to, for him to arrest a 26 year old opposition uh, journalist as it happened uh, um, a week ago. So uh, Putin uh, sick and aging, he's, he's becoming more unpredictable and therefore, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a danger for the entire world to have, to have uh, the kind of regime that exists in Russia uh, now. That's why uh, I do think that the uh, Kissinger's uh, policy towards Russia, it is, you know, let's have stable relationship and forget about everything else, is not going to be beneficial to anyone in the world, not uh, for sure. So that's what I would say to uh, the Biden administration. Don't make this mistake. You have, you know, you, ha you are dealing with people who care more about money than about anything else. Then be smart, use this and make a, tr a deal with them, you know. Go into trade, you know, trade uh, souls uh, for sanctions. 
Well, Jenya, unfortunately, we've made the mistake once again of not allocating three hours for this discussion because I know we could keep on talking. <laughs> it would be just as interesting, but we'll have to continue uh, some other time. I want to thank you for another, as always, very provoc provocative uh, lecture and answers to the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha.